Howdy folks, welcome to module 1 of the CompTIA A plus course. This first module of the full course is titled, as you can see, Installing Motherboards and Connectors. The main sections or topics we'll be covering in this specific module are the following. The first will be Cable Types and Connectors. Then we'll be covering the section called Install and Configure Motherboards followed by the third and last section called legacy cable types so those are the three main topics or should i say sections we'll be covering they are however not the only topics we'll be covering though folks if you'd like a better idea of what we'll be covering in this specific module of a plus you can find a more detailed list with timestamps in the video description down below Alrighty, now before we go ahead and jump into the first main section, if any of you folks are new to my channel, I will be doing a dedicated video for each of the 20 modules of the full official CompTIA A Plus 1100 series course. I also happen to do free training on lots of other courses from various vendors, so if you're curious on what else I train, feel free to go and check out the channel. If you folks haven't done it already, do your homie a favor and boink that like button. It really helps me get this free training in front of more people out there that actually needs it, that quite often cannot afford to pay for training. If you yourself would like to know when I upload new lessons or courses, maybe consider subscribing, otherwise you might miss it. Well, now that I've got that selfless promo out of the way, let's jump into the first main section, which was called Cable Types and Connectors. Now, within this first section, the first topic we'll be discussing is personal computers. All right, so since this is A+, we're going to start you guys off nice and slow at the beginning, starting with the system case. Now, with the system case topic, you get what we call all-in-one versus tower. So I think just to help elaborate on what I'm talking about, here is a picture of an all-in-one. I want you guys to specifically look at the screen there, ignore the mouse and the keyboard. So that screen there, believe it or not, is actually a full-blown computer. That is an all-in-one, and often you'll find it's actually a touch screen as well. So you can touch the screen, the actual motherboard, the RAM, chips, everything of your computer is within that screen. Pretty much like a laptop, come to think of it. So if you look at a laptop, everything you need from your computer is within that laptop. Now, if you look at tower, here's an example for tower. Now, that might be a computer, but it doesn't have everything you need. For example, the screen is now missing. There's no screen. You cannot press any buttons other than a power button and a restart button. So that is an example of a tower. So the previous one I showed you guys, that was an all-in-one. Everything will be in the screen. And this one is a tower. Both of them have benefits. Both of them have drawbacks. If you look at an all-in-one, they obviously take up way less space. You can put a little bugger on your desk and that's it. It's pretty much all you need. If you look at a tower case, that takes up a heck of a lot more space. A tower, on the other hand, is a lot cheaper and a lot easier to go and upgrade. If you look at the all-in-one that we had earlier, that one is very expensive to go and buy. You know, the all-in-one just at first glance is going to be very expensive to go and buy. And when you want to go and upgrade it, you'll find often it's not possible to do so. And if it is, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Now, since we're talking about towers of computers, let's talk about the front panel ports and features of these tower cases. If this feels like it's a very easy topic, you have to keep in mind, a is also designed for people that's brand new in IT, that's never done IT before. So we're going to start things off nice and slow of easy topics. And as we go along in this course, further into the modules and all that, the topic is going to get more and more advanced and more and more complex, obviously. Now, as for the front panels, as you guys can see there, we've got a couple of USB ports on this one. We've got an audio jack, we've got a mic jack, we've got a power button, we've got an optical drive. Pretty much standard what you would expect to find on the average tower case. Now, there are tower cases out there that has multiple, multiple optical drives. Some of them have none. If I'm being honest, I think majority of computers these days will probably come out of no optical drive. And that actually includes laptops. I mean, when last have you seen someone use a DVD or a CD on anything? People just don't use that anymore. And the manufacturers, the factories, they know that. So they just remove these optical drives altogether, bringing down the price of the unit, which means it's cheaper for you. You can afford it. And then it also means they're going to get more sales. So it's a win-win. Everybody wins because we know you're not going to use it anyway. 
Now as for the actual ports, you'll find on the average computer you will find USB ports and sound ports, audio jacks in the front. There are cases where you might actually find them on the top of the case, you know, especially if you look at some gaming cases. Some of these gaming cases you get these days are really, really fancy. You'll find a couple of USB ports or audio jacks at the front or at the top. Power buttons, restart buttons, they can be all over the place, quite frankly. Um, you'll find some of them have got fancy lights, some of them don't, but in essence, they do the same thing. You'll turn the machine on and they'll allow you to restart the machine. Now let's talk about the side panel. Now since we're talking about the side panel, I think this is a very poor picture to show you guys. So I think, let me flip this box around. Here we are looking at the side of a computer tower case. So obviously the side panel has now been removed. And if you remove that, you can effectively see the internal components of this machine. I suppose one might call this the organs of the computer. You'll be able to see your machine's motherboard. You'll be able to see the RAM modules, sometimes referred to as RAM chips. You'll be able to see your graphics card, hard drives, power supply unit, you name it, you'll be able to see all of it, the insides of your computer case. So what you folks will notice is almost each and every machine tends to look somewhat different compared to the last one. So they all have a motherboard, they all have hard drives and RAM modules and all of that. But where you find the power supply unit, for example, is not necessarily the same for all cases. Where you find the hard drives these days is not necessarily the same for all cases, especially if you look at the fancy gaming cases you get. And also if you consider the fact that you get solid state hard drives and mechanical hard drives nowadays, where you find these components could vary from one unit to another. I mean, here's another example of another system unit that I've got for you guys. So in essence, one plus one will always be two here, but just keep in mind, they may not look exactly the same if you compare one to another one especially if you're going to open a laptop or compare it to another laptop. Let's talk about the rear panel ports and features. So I think let's first flip this box around. So here is the back of a box and there you can see the rear ports. So the top left of this picture, there you can see the ports of the motherboard. Now, if you ever wondered why those ports fit in perfectly into that little panel there, that is because that little panel where the motherboard slides through actually comes with the motherboard. So if you were to go and buy yourself a computer case or if you go and buy one for a client and you're now about to go and build this machine completely yourself from scratch. What you'll notice is where the motherboard is supposed to go, you know, where those ports are supposed to stick out, is just one giant big hole, a rectangle hole. And if you were to open the box of the motherboard, one of the things you'll find in that box, besides the motherboard, is that little aluminium panel. So you're going to go and open your computer box, you're going to open the side panel, and you're going to press that panel in, you know, from the inside towards the outside. And it's actually going to go and click into place. And you'll find that panel perfectly aligned with your new motherboard. And if you ever find yourself needing to replace the motherboard with a different one, you're going to first have to take out the old motherboard, once you've done so, from the outside, you will press that panel towards the inside. And it's actually going to shoot inside. It's going to shoot out. And then you just go and open the new motherboard box, take out the new aluminium panel, and you just put it in as if it was the first one, of course. If you look towards the bottom of that system unit case, you'll find there's a couple other ports, especially if you look at the middle area there, a whole bunch of graphics ports and stuff. So 10 to 1, this case is a gaming case or something of that sort. You can see it definitely has a graphics card of some kind. So on average, those little holes there where the graphics card slides through would normally be blocked by some sort of aluminium or plastic cover. And you can normally just click them out of place or you have to break them open. Yes, you have to actually break them open in some cases. Although the newer fancier cases these days, you don't actually have to go and break them open. You just go and click them open, slot in your graphics card into the motherboard and into that exact slot. And if you need to go and remove the card for whatever reason one day, you can always just go and slide those little plastic covers back into place. If you look way at the bottom of this case, that would be your PSU. So all IT guys and IT just normally refer to that as the PSU, which is short for Power Supply Unit. Now in this specific case, it happens to be at the bottom, but you'll find for the majority of cases out there, it's actually at the top. So your average office computer, your average home computer would probably have that PSU at the top of the case. The reality of the matter is it doesn't actually matter where it is, as long as it's in the box, as long as it's able to reach the motherboard and provide power to the motherboard, it doesn't actually matter where it is. 
So the newer, fancier cases, especially if you go look at the gaming cases and those kinds of cases, this PSU normally tends to be towards the bottom of the case. So this is probably going to be a gaming case. I mean, the fact that it's got a graphics card tells me it's a gaming case. Anywho, let's move on to our second topic in this section. That would be universal serial bus cables. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? So universal serial bus, first of all, is the actual word for USB. So whenever people say USB, that is actually what it stands for. Universal serial bus, people. So the first thing we want to talk about here is USB connector types. You actually get many kinds of USB connector types. Now, looking at the picture I have here for you folks on the right, specifically the top part of the picture with USB 2.0. If you look at the one at the top left, which falls into the category of 2.0, this one is called Type A. It allows you to connect one end to the host, being your computer in most cases, and the other end to assorted peripheral devices, which we don't actually really see anymore. This connector should be inserted with the USB symbol facing up, by the way. You'll find, depending on what kind of cable we're using these days, sometimes the symbol has to face upwards, other times it doesn't really matter. It's a potato-potato situation. So the newer and, and the more modern the cable is, the less it actually matters. But of the older cables, it matters. And if you look at the connector right next to it, which is called Type B, this connector is used for large devices, large devices like printers. And we still very widely use this cable, mind you, but you'll more commonly find this in a home environment, small office, home office environment. We don't really find these in medium to large size companies because there they normally have those big printers and those ones are normally connected via network cable or connected via wireless. There we don't really use the USB cables. Looking at the connector called Type B Mini, it's a smaller peripheral device connector. They were mostly used on things like the first digital cameras we used to get. But we don't really use these either anymore. They'll have a hard time finding a device these days that actually still uses this kind of cable. Then we also have the connector called Type B Micro. Now this one might actually look familiar to most of you since it's an updated connector for smaller devices such as smartphones and tablets. All in all, a USB cable can feature type A to type A connectors or can convert from one type to another. For example, you can convert type A to type B or you can convert from type A to Microsoft type B. Now, as for USB 3, those are obviously the newer types of cables, which generally are a heck of a lot faster than the old USB 2 cables. So, within USB 3, there are new versions of the Type A, Type B, and Type B micro connectors with additional signaling pins and wires. You folks will notice that often with USB 3, the actual connector itself will have some blue in it somewhere, and the actual USB 3 port itself. We also have some blue in it somewhere along the line. This is usually to indicate that it's a USB 3 port or a USB 3 connector. So whenever you see blue, then you know, USB 3. Now, even though they use different colors to show us which is which, they are actually somewhat compatible with one another to a certain extent. You can, for example, go and take a USB 2 type A cable and plug it into a USB 3 type A port and vice versa. It will work just fine. The only thing you're going to notice is the speed is not going to be, you know, to its full extent. It's not going to live up to its full potential since it's going to be bottlenecking. Now, what you cannot do is, for example, plug a USB 3 Type B cable into a USB 2 Type B port. Those definitely are not going to work, folks. Anywho, here we have some other types of cables: HDMI and DisplayPort video cables. So HDMI is short for High Definition Multimedia Interface, if you were wondering. No, you don't need to know what HDMI stands for in the actual exams. They won't ask you that, so I wouldn't worry about it. As long as you guys know what an HDMI cable is used for, you're good. That's all you need to know for the exams. Now here I have a picture for you guys of a normal sized HDMI cable on the left and a mini HDMI cable on the right. You can't really tell the difference much in this picture, but I assure you there is quite a size difference in real life. 
I haven't really seen the mini HDMI cable being used that much, but the normal one, on the other hand, that one is used all over with just about anything these days. Anything that's got a display, basically. You'll find pretty much any monitor, screen, TV, you name it, has HDMI ports. You'll find them on most computer graphics cards and laptops as well. And the list goes on and on and on. It's a very popular high definition video cable that has the ability to also send audio over the cable. Most folks only use them for video though, but you need to make sure you remember that HDMI has the ability to transmit audio signals over the same cable at the same time. There are questions in the exam about that folks, so watch out for that. Now speaking of video cables, you also get display port video cables. There's a picture for you folks at the bottom right. You'll notice that at first glance, the display port cable and the connector looks very much the same as the HDMI one. If you look closer though, you'll see the connector is in fact different. You cannot plug the one cable into the other one's port. It just won't fit. So some of you folks are probably wondering now, what is the difference between the HDMI and the display port cable? Well, the truth is they're actually very much the same. The HDMI cables came out first and were out for quite some time before the display port cables came out. The HDMI was developed by consumer electronics companies and requires a royalty to use. So that's where display port comes into the picture, if you see where I'm going with this. It was developed as a royalty free standard by the Video Electronics Standard Association, which is basically an organization that represents PC graphics adapter and display technology companies. All in all, you will see the display port option on a lot more devices these days, especially graphics cards or PCs. Now, moving on to some other cable types we get, here we have Thunderbolt and Lightning cables. Not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So starting off the Thunderbolt cable, this cable is actually very interesting. Not only can it be used as a display interface, like DisplayPort or HDMI, which we literally just spoke of, it can actually in fact also be used as a general peripheral interface like USB. How cool is that? Here's the picture on the right of the Thunderbolt cable, just in case you guys were wondering what it looks like. So if folks want to or need to, you can actually go ahead and connect a computer monitor that's got a display port to a Thunderbolt port on a computer itself with a suitable adapter, of course. What you folks can also go and do with Thunderbolt, which is also possible of display port, mind you, you can go and daisy chain multiple monitors to a single port. Pretty nifty, right? And let me tell you, that's very useful in some cases. So if you find yourself in a sticky situation where you or a user only has one display port or one Thunderbolt port, you can, in fact, actually go ahead and connect multiple monitors on that one single port. Now, this is called daisy chaining. Watch out for that, by the way. That's also going to be in the exam. All right, and then we also have the lightning connector. Here's a picture of one. It's the white one on the right, as if you didn't know that. So this, Apple's iPhone and iPad mobile devices use a proprietary lightning port and connector. The lightning port is found only on Apple's mobile devices. So if you need to connect this device to something like a computer, you will need an adapter cable. But the good news is they're very easy to find. It will have to be a lightning to USB A or a lightning to USB C, but they are very easy to come by. So don't worry about it. Anywho, let's move on to SATA hard drive cables. So SATA, first of all, is short for Serial Advanced Technology Attachment. SATA for short. So SATA, you know, if you guys are familiar with SATA, is something we use when it comes to optical drives and our hard drives, which is storage. So they're a replacement for the old PATA hard drives and PATA cables and stuff like that. So SATA, let's first of all talk about the data connector. So you get two kinds of cables when it comes to SATA. You get the one for data and you get the one for power. So when it comes to data, here's a picture for you guys on the right. So you can see there's a red cable. Now, I would say the red one is probably one of the, the most common ones you guys are going to get. But the reality is the color doesn't matter. It can be any color the rainbow. So the most common colors you'll probably encounter when it comes to these SATA data cables are red, pink, yellow, orange. But they also commonly come you know, forth in other colors. I mean, I've seen them in black and white and pink and blue. 
any color you can imagine is what they come forth in. They still do the same thing at the end of the day. So you can go and plug one end into the motherboard, which end it doesn't matter because it's the same on both sides. You plug one end into the motherboard, you plug the other end of that data cable into the actual optical drive. So in other words, the old DVD drives or CD-ROM drives, it's probably going to be a DVD-ROM drive. Or you plug it into a hard drive. Now let's face it, it's probably going to be a hard drive because nobody uses DVD drives these days. Another kind of cable we get when we talk about SATA is the actual power cable itself. At the bottom right, here is a picture for you guys of what that would more or less look like. You'll find the power supply these days has various kinds of power cables. Some of them are the old white Molex ones which we used to use in the old hard drives and the old optical drives. And then they also have these black ones. That is for the newer SATA drives. SATA hard drives, SATA optical drives. So the good news is both of these cables, the data one and the power one, can only plug in one way. If you go and get one, you know, a picture of a high resolution picture of one online, or if you happen to have one close by, you'll notice that connector can only plug in one way. So there's certain pieces of plastic that's missing, which basically forces you to be able to only plug that little doohickey in one way. Now, speaking of the old Molex connectors, which I just mentioned, let's just put that as a bullet point here. That is what it looks like. So at the bottom left, that is the one that we used to use for donkey years. We used to use those for decades. Um, and you might still find them. You know, if you go buy yourself a power supply these days, um, depending on how fancy it is and how new it is, you might actually still encounter a power supply that has got a couple of those Molex connectors on it. These days, we more commonly only use them for the case fans. Some of the case fans actually do take those as is. Other times, the case fans will take a smaller version of the Molex connector. So that's basically what we used to use in the old days and the old hard drives and the old optical drives, just in case you guys were curious. So that's a Molex. Anyway, folks, guess what? We have reached the end of the first section or the first main topic in this module. That brings us to the second main section or the second main topic in this module, which is install and configure motherboards. Now, the first topic we're going to be talking about in this second section is electrical safety and ESD. Now, if you don't know what ESD is, that is short for electrostatic discharge. So before we can go ahead and install anything on a computer, you know, whether it be a laptop, desktop, server, you name it, there's certain things you need to be aware of and there's certain things you need to go and do or practice before you can actually go ahead and install any components into a computer or before you can go ahead and troubleshoot or remove any components of the computer. So that is obviously why we talk about electricity here and all that. So let's start off the more important one out of the two here, which is your own safety, electrical safety. So before you go ahead and open a computer box, a server, a laptop, a printer, whatever the heck it might be, you should always go and unplug the device. Turn it off by the wall socket, flip the switch, make sure it's dead, and just for extra precaution, pull out the cable, completely pull it out from the wall. And what I want to add on to that, which is not actually part of this course, you'll find at the back of the power supply. This is not something you'll find on all power supplies, but half of the power supplies at the back actually has a switch as well, which you can go and turn off. It's not really necessary to go and flip that if you've plugged it out of the wall, but you know what? Do it anyway. Rather safe than sorry, I say. So the very first thing we do for obvious reasons you plug everything out. Now let's move on to the topic of electrostatic discharge. What the cheese is that? So let me start by saying, did you know the human body has enough static electricity in it to blow circuitry? It can blow things like a motherboard, can blow things like your RAM chips, RAM modules, whatever you want to go and call them, can blow your graphics card, and so on and so forth. So what I mean by that is, if you were to go and just touch your motherboard, I kid you not, just touch it, or just to go ahead and just touch the RAM chips or whatever the case might be, you can actually blow those components with the electricity that's stored in your human body. Yeah, did you know that? That is a fun fact. So that becomes a bit problematic, you know, when we need to go and install components, uninstall them, troubleshoot them, and all that kinds of stuff. So with that being said, some of the things we're going to be using is anti-static tools. 
So we're not just going to go and use normal screwdrivers or normal tweezers and stuff. You'll find that we computer technicians use anti-static screwdrivers, anti-static tweezers, anti-static this, anti-static that. All the tools we use, they look like normal tools, but they're not. They're not conductive. They're anti-static. What you should also go and use, and I can be honest with you guys, almost nobody uses this in real life, is an anti-static wrist strap. Now you might want to be wondering, what the heck is an anti-static wrist strap? So an anti-static wrist strap is a strap you put around your wrist or your ankle. They say wrist strap, but you can actually put it around your ankle as well. It's got a little cable, and at the edge of that cable or the end of that cable is a little alligator clip. And you're supposed to go and clip that alligator clip to a rubber mat, or clip it to the frame of the computer you're working on, preferably the inside of the frame, which is conductive. Now, in case you guys are still wondering what the heck I'm talking about, here is a picture of what an anti-static wrist strap would look like. Now, you know, just to a little disclosure, that picture is, is of a little black slash yellow one, but in reality, they're normally blue most commonly, but it doesn't really matter what color they are. You can still see what it looks like. So you're supposed to go and strap that around your arm or your leg or wherever or on your body. It doesn't actually matter as long as it's on your body. And then the little alligator clip needs to preferably be clipped to a rubber mat or be clipped to the actual frame of the computer. Once you've done that, you can actually go ahead and touch the components. Now, speaking of clipping this to the frame, let me show you guys another picture. Here's a picture of what it looks like when this bra goes ahead and clips this thingy to the frame of a computer case. You can see there, it's on the inside of the frame. So yeah, that's what you're supposed to do according to the actual official A plus course. It's what you're supposed to do according to the official slides, the official manual, and according to the manual. But the fact of the matter is in real life, none of us actually do that. Nobody does that. I don't even do that. I've never done that. But I'm telling you guys about it nonetheless, because they will ask you about that in the exam. I guarantee it. You will get questions about that in the exam. But as soon as you've written these exams and passed these exams, then you know what? Go and forget about it. Nobody actually does that. Now you might wonder, okay, but if nobody does that, isn't that a bit of a problem? Uh, yes and no. So in the old days, and when I say old days, this was as recently as 10 years ago, motherboards and components were that sensitive. Nowadays, these components are so robust, you know, you can go and touch them and nothing's going to happen. But even if you are concerned about that, you know what you can go and do? Just touch the actual frame itself. So if you're standing in front of the case, you can actually go and open the side panel and before you go ahead and touch something inside the box, what you can do is you just touch the frame of the case, preferably the inside of the frame, because the outside is sometimes made out of plastic or other kinds of weird metal. So you want to go and touch the inside of the frame. Once you've touched the inside of the frame, then you can go and touch a random component inside the case and you're not going to go and blow anything. Why? Because you, as a human, just discharge directly into the frame. Something you want to keep in mind though when you do this is if you walk away from that case, let's say it's just a couple of steps, even if it's not on a carpet or something, you actually could possibly um, generate enough electricity again to go and blow something. So every time you come back to the computer, you want to go and discharge again and again and again. In the beginning, it's obviously going to require a lot of concentration for you to do that and to remember to do that. But as time goes by, it's going to become muscle memory. You're going to do it instinctively without even thinking about it. That is what the average technician does. That is what I do. I just touch the inside of the case, discharge, and then I do go and play with whatever I need to go and play inside. And then, yeah, as easy as that. That's what people do in real life. But according to the exam and according to the course, guys, you need to use an anti-static wrist strap or an anti-static ankle strap. That will be the answer in the exam. So if they tell you anything regarding ESD, uh, the user is trying to avoid ESD or what can you go and use to prevent ESD, anything in that regard in the exam, the answer will always be an anti-static wrist strap in the exam. All right, moving on to motherboard connector types. Now here on the right, I've got a nice little picture for you folks. It's actually the same one we used in the previous version of A+. So you'll notice if you go and to the old version of A+, and the new version of A+, there is a lot of content that overlaps. Like I said in the beginning of this video, actually more in the introduction video of this course, it's about 90% to 95% the same content. So CompTIA literally just went and reshuffled the contents of different modules. 
So yeah, you guys are going to see some of the same pictures. If you've watched my previous version of A+, here and there, you're going to see some of the same topics, same pictures, same everything, because, well, it's the same course, technically speaking. Now, looking at the picture we've got here on the right, if you look at the one that says CPU socket. So CPU is short for Central Processing Unit. That is effectively where the brains of your computer would go into. Now, the reason why we call it CPU, central, in other words, is because it used to actually be in the center of the motherboard. Nowadays, it's still kind of in the center, you know, more towards the top, but it's not exactly in the middle of the motherboard. So, yeah, as time goes by, things tend to change. I mean, that's nothing new in life. So the CPU is still in the middle of you compare it from left to right, but from bottom to top, it's more towards the top now, obviously. So if you look at on the right where it says memory slots, so in this specific picture, we've got four slots, four memory slots or memory module slots. On the average motherboard, you can expect to find about two. So I would say four is more for the expensive or more expensive motherboards, you know, gaming motherboards, those kinds of things. You'll also notice that those memory slots are two different colors. Two of them are dark, so if you look at the first one and the third one, they're very dark. If you look at the second one and the fourth one, they're lighter in color. The fact of the matter is the colors doesn't actually matter. I mean, they can actually be any color of the rainbow. What does matter is which ones are the same color, whatever color that might be. You'll normally notice the first one and the third one tend to be the same color. The second one and the fourth one tend to be the same color and so on and so forth. That is because they're on the same channel. More on that once we actually get to the RAM section, so we're gonna probably get to that in this specific module, so let's just hold on to that. Then we've got disk drive connectors, way at the bottom right on that motherboard. So that is going to be your SATA connectors for those of you guys that's familiar with SATA. Now this is actually a pretty neat motherboard because if I look at this picture, you can see that they're sliding in from the right side there not from the top. The average motherboard I've dealt with at the majority of my clients, majority of gaming boards, and even my own motherboards, these SATA connectors generally type, uh, tend to, you know, plug in from the top. And it's very often in that same area, it's just normally from the top. And that becomes a bit of a problem because if you want to go and plug in very large expansion cards like graphics cards, these cards very often tend to go over those ports which makes it next to impossible to go and plug in any SATA cables. So you cannot plug in any hard drives, you cannot plug in any optical drives, because the cables are going to be in the way, which means you cannot plug in your graphics card. Or if you do plug in your graphics card, you're not going to be able to plug in those devices. So it's an either or kind of situation then. So some clever bloke out there came up with this clever tactic, where instead of having you plug them in from the top, they have now kind of swapped the ports around so that you can actually plug in from the side. And I think the intention was to accommodate the folks that actually have a fancy graphics card. So that's probably what they had in mind. They probably saw a lot of people were complaining about it. So thank goodness to whoever came up with this tactic. So yeah, but you might possibly still find them facing upwards. If you look at the bottom right, we've got adapter card slots. How many you've got really depends on the make and the model of your motherboard. And also a little bit about, you know, how much you pay for it. The more you pay, the more you get, like in most things in life. So if you look at the, the little white slot there, the one that's much lighter in color than the other ones, that would be your graphics card slot. Or should I say your main graphics card slot. This is known as your PCIe. The E stands for Express. Now the average motherboard will only have one of these, if you're lucky. Normally they would have at least one. But depending on how much money you're willing to throw at your motherboard, you might potentially actually have two, maybe three or even four of those slots. The more you pay, the more you get. So if you have more than one graphics card slot, you can in fact go and put in more than one graphics card at the same time. If you're wondering which one you're going to be connecting your monitor to, your screen, it's normally going to be the first one, the main one, which is at the top. All the other ones are secondary ones, additional ones to give you increased graphics performance. I don't actually recommend that because most of the time if you go and pull that stunt, you're going to find the increase you're going to get on average is somewhere between 7% and 20%. You'll actually be better off buying yourself one graphics card, which is slightly more expensive than one of those cards, and um, just putting that one card. You can actually get more performance. It's going to take up less space. You're going to be able to buy a cheaper motherboard. It's going to use less electricity, less power in other words. It's a win, win, win all the way. So instead of paying 
let's say 2K for two cards, which means it's 4K in total, you can buy yourself a one graphics card, which is worth 3K now. And that one 3K graphics card is just going to give you benefits all the way, including giving you more performance than the two cards, which were would have been combined. I'm not saying that's always going to be the case, but usually that tends to be the case. Then way on the left there, we've got I.O. ports. So if you're not sure what that stands for, that is input and output ports. Input would be something like your mouse, your keyboard, that kinds of stuff. Maybe a, possibly a webcam. Output would probably be something like, I don't know, your printer, your speakers. If you look at something like the USB port, that probably classifies as both input and output. It really depends on what you're going to go and plug in there. If you look at something like your VGA, your DVI, your HDMI, your display ports, those are all screen ports for your monitor. So those are probably all external output ports, if you think about it. Anyway, so let's, let's take a little bit of a closer look at this motherboard. So here you can see same picture, a little bit of a closer look. So there is our CPU socket. You'll find that every motherboard and every CPU out there has a different amount of pins. Now, in the past, I would you know, I'd probably make this sound like it was a very long time ago, but that's actually not that long ago. The pins on average used to always be on the CPU. And, you know, if you go and compare the price of the average motherboard and every CPU, you would find the CPU normally tends to be way more expensive than the motherboard. If I have to thumb suck it and just make up a couple of numbers, the motherboard might cost you 500 and the CPU might cost you 3000. Now, if you were to accidentally break one of these two, which one would you prefer to go and break? If it was me, I would prefer to break the one that was cheaper, which is probably the motherboard. Now, unfortunately, the pins used to always be on the CPU. And if you bent a pin, broke a pin, guess what? You're going to have to throw away or dispose of the more expensive one out of the two. So some clever bloke came up with the idea to put the pins on the motherboard side instead, which is now referred to as LGA. Back in the day, we used to call it PGA, Pin Grid Array. Now, LGA is now known as Land Grid Array, which means the pins are now on the motherboard. And if you bend or break a pin, now you just replace the motherboard, which might seem like a big deal because it's a big item, but the reality is the motherboard is very often way cheaper than the CPU. So trust me, you want to rather replace the motherboard than the CPU because the CPU is going to cost you way more, folks. Now, if you want to go and build yourself a PC or build one for your client, I would suggest you first start off by checking what CPU you want to buy. What CPU does your customer want, your user want, or what CPU do you want? If you, for example, decide on an i7, which one do you want? Because there's many i7s. What kind of clock speed do you want? What kind of cache do you want? So once you decide on i7 that's going to give you reasonable performance and it's going to fit your pocket, then you need to go and check what the socket size of that i7 CPU is. I'm just using an i7 as an example. This could be any kind of CPU. So normally on the box of the CPU or the packaging, whatever, you, know, you can even check it online, it tells you what socket it is. If you don't know what the socket is, that's the amount of pins it has. So if it tells you in the box or the packaging or the labeling that it's 1155, that means it's got 1,155 pins or contact points for the pins because the pins are now on the motherboard. So if you want to go and buy yourself a motherboard now, which is probably going to be the next item on your agenda, you need to go and look for a, a motherboard that fits your pocket, but also one that is a socket 1155. Otherwise, it's not going to be compatible with your CPU. If I, for example, go buy a motherboard that's a socket 775, that means it's got 775 pins, but my CPU has got 1,155 contact points. It's going to be a mismatch. They're not going to be able to make contact with one another. So you need to make sure the CPU has got the same amount of contact points as the motherboard has pins. So if your CPU is a 775, your motherboard needs to be a 775. So that's some of the things you need to keep in mind. So I would suggest you start the CPU, then you start the motherboard. And once you've decided on the motherboard, you go and check what kind of RAM that motherboard takes. So if it takes DDR3, if it takes DDR4 or DDR5, you go and check what kind of RAM it takes. And then you obviously just go and buy that RAM. Easy peasy, right? Now, as for the left-hand side there, you'll see they mention motherboard heat sinks. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys. This motherboard has a lot of heat sinks. Normally, they don't have that many. 
So the average motherboard will have two heat sinks, one of which is actually removable. So the main heat sink, the first one would normally be on top of the CPU. So once you have decided on a CPU, you're going to go and put it in there. You're going to put a little heat paste or thermal compound on top of that CPU. More on that later. We can actually get to that. So don't worry about that just yet. Then you're going to put your heat sink on top of the CPU. We're also going to show you guys pictures of that later on in the cooling module. So there's a whole module and section where we talk about cooling and thermal compound and heat paste. So if you're wondering what all of those are, do not fear about it. We are going to discuss that in a later module. It's all part of the course. So you're going to put a heat sink on top of the CPU. It's basically a piece of metal which is made out of aluminium. And the reason why we do that is because that CPU gets very, very hot. And the idea here ultimately is the heat from that CPU that gets generated needs to be transferred into this piece of metal which is on top of it. It's made out of aluminium because it stays cool a lot longer and it absorbs heat a lot better than most metals. And just as an extra precaution, we normally go and hook up a fan on top of that heat sink which blows air between the vents of that heat sink. So it works very, very much the same as a car's radiator. So, you know, as you drive around, the water from the engine goes into a radiator and an air that's blowing in from the front normally blows in through the fins of the radiator. And that ultimately cools down the water, and once it's cooled down, it goes back into the engine to cool the engine down even further, of course. All right, let's move on to memory slots. So still obviously on the topic of motherboards. Now we're looking more closer to the right side of the motherboard where we saw those RAM slots earlier, which are known as memory slots. So memory in a computer, we're not talking about hard drive, is referred to as RAM, random access memory. So the principal storage space for computer data and program instructions, volatile memory that loses data when there is no power. So you didn't, do you know what they mean by that? A RAM chip is seen as volatile memory, and that means if power is lost to the RAM chip, everything that was in that RAM chip is now lost. So how this is going to work is when you start your machine or a user or a customer or a client starts their machine, Obviously, there's an operating system in most cases. There's a bunch of programs and data and stuff on there. And whenever you or the user opens a program or a document or something, eventually it's going to start displaying onto your screen. It might possibly indicate on the taskbar that a couple of things are open. Now, if you were to go and yank out the battery of that laptop or yank out the power cord of that desktop machine, does that mean you've got to go and reinstall Windows, reinstall all the programs and you know, copy all the data back onto the machine. No, you don't have to do that. You'll find it's still on the machine. When you start that machine, you just need to go and reopen the program in question or reopen the document in question. So what that means is that data was stored on the hard drive, which is non-volatile. So if power is lost, whatever is on the hard drive is not lost because the hard drive is non-volatile. Now, why did the programs close though and the documents close though? Because that was loaded into the RAM modules, which is, in fact, volatile. So anything that you have got open on your screen, any programs, games, documents, and files, that that you've got open is currently in your RAM. And if power is lost to your machine, whatever was in the RAM, in other words, your temporary memory, is lost. Not permanently lost, it's just lost so when you start the machine again in question, you're just going to have to go and reload it back into the RAM. And this can be done by just opening the program or the game in question again, or just opening the document or the files or whatever the case might be again. And that's going to load it back into the RAM. So the reason why we do that into RAM is because the RAM is a lot faster than the hard drive. So if we have to go and transfer data between the hard drive and the CPU, ziggity zag, ziggity zag like that, nothing would get done because it's just too freaking slow. So the hard drive is still a nice place for long-term storage. So whatever you need to work on program-wise, game-wise, documents or files-wise, you're going to go and click on those files or programs or whatever it might be. It gets loaded into the RAM, which is much faster memory, but unfortunately it is volatile. And while you're working on that file or that game or that program, all of that goes ziggity-zag between your RAM chips and the CPU, which is much, much, much faster. Now, if you look at that picture there, as I've said earlier, you'll find that those RAM slots there are different colors. So the first one and the third one are very dark in color. 
and the second one and the fourth one are very light in color. I did mention to you folks earlier that the colors doesn't actually really matter. What does matter is which ones are which color, but the colors themselves does not matter. So the reason why the first one and the third one are the same color, whatever that might be, is because they are the same channel. This is seen as channel one. The reason why the second one and the fourth one are the same color is because they are the same channel, which would be seen as channel two. So when you have only one RAM chip, it doesn't really matter which RAM slot you're going to put that RAM chip in, it will still work. My suggestion to you folks would be to go and put it into RAM slot closest to the CPU though, because that's just closer to the CPU. And for a computer that is light here. So if you're going to go put it into the second slot away from the CPU, or the slot that's third away from the CPU, that is light years for your machine. So you can actually make your PC a little bit faster by simply putting the RAM chip into the slot closest to the CPU. Now, if you happen to have a second RAM chip, you would not put it into the second slot. You would put it into the third slot. You have to fill up a channel first before you can start with a new one. Now, if you only have one, you're going to start at the channel closest to the CPU. So that will probably be that dark slot there. So you're going to start at the, clo the slot closest to the CPU. If you happen to have a second RAM chip, you would start with the second slot of that first channel, which obviously would be the third one there. You can see the third one and the first one is the same color. If you have a third RAM chip, you're going to start the procedure all over again. So now you're going to start with a new channel, but preferably you want to start at the slot that's closest to the CPU. So you would start with slot two. And if you happen to have a fourth RAM chip, you would start by putting it into the second slot of channel two, which will be the fourth slot there. So I hope that makes sense for you guys. So it's not a rule that you have to put it into the slot closest to the CPU. But what is kind of a rule, I would say, is to make sure you put them into the same channel. Otherwise, it's not going to work, folks. So you have to fill up a channel first before you can start off a new channel. All right, so let's move to the bottom left of this motherboard. So we did kind of look at this earlier when we spoke about graphics cards and expansion cards to a certain degree. So now we're going to focus on this little coin there at the bottom left. It's usually somewhere at the bottom left. Um, there are cases where you might possibly find it at the bottom right of a motherboard. But it's more common to find this little doohickey at the bottom left of a motherboard. What is that coin? It's a coin cell battery. You're probably wondering to yourself, why the heck would there be a battery on my motherboard? Now, all motherboards have these batteries. It allows your computer to keep track of certain things. It allows your computer to remember certain things. Let me give you an example. Have you ever plugged out, I mean like completely plug out the battery for your laptop or completely plug out the power cord to a desktop PC. Have you ever done that and have you noticed that the computer always seems to keep track of its time? It never really forgets what time it is, it keeps track of the time. So if it was a certain date and a certain time, the computer would still remember that even though the battery was plugged out or even though the power cord was plugged out. How the heck do you think that is possible? It is because of that battery, which is known as your CMOS battery in most cases. So that allows the machine to remember time. It, remember, it allows it to remember all kinds of other things like the boot order. So if your machine has to start by looking for a bootable device, you know, maybe at the hard drive first or the CD-ROM first or a flash drive first, that is how your computer remembers where it needs to look for a bootable device first. So if that battery starts becoming flat, because all batteries eventually become flat, you'll first notice this because of the timer, the clock would start falling behind. So if it's one o'clock in the afternoon, you might find your computer will tell you it's 12 o'clock. And now here you go and correct the time on your machine. And after a day or a couple of days or so, you'll find it starts falling behind and it starts falling behind and more and more and starts happening quicker and quicker. That is an indication this battery is starting to run flat. And if it runs flat completely, it's going to actually start causing issues in your machine. I would not say it's not going to work at all, but it does start causing issues on the machine. You want to try and avoid that, obviously. So how long do these batteries last? They normally last about five to 10 years on average, but I've actually seen this last about between 10 and 20 years on some machines. So there has also been cases where I got to a client, it's a machine that's only one year old, two years old, or less than five years old for the matter, and the battery would be completely dead. So I can't tell you why that happens. It could be that maybe it's just a, a dud. You know, I suppose we get duds. It could be that when they made that motherboard in the factory, maybe they were using an old batch of batteries. I don't know. So, but on average, you can expect no less than five years and it could last up to 10 years. So that's, that's the average. 
If you happen to have a battery run flat on your motherboard, which is very unlikely, most likely the motherboard's going to fail way, way before the battery runs flat. But if it does happen to you, I would say just go and grab the battery from an old failed motherboard. Everyone in IT always has a motherboard or two lying around with an old battery on it. And that battery normally works. So you just go and grab the battery from an old motherboard that's now blown or broken or something in that regard. And you go to your motherboard, you take it out, and you just put in your old battery, of the battery from the broken motherboard, and there you go. So yeah, we can say here, it lasts about 5 to 10 years. The powers, this battery powers the RTC, which keeps track of the system date and time. And it keeps track of your settings, like the boot order of your computer. So that's what it does nutshell. I probably didn't need to tell you guys that much, but I like to go overboard because I know you guys need to write the exam. And in the, the day, I would really love it when you guys can actually pass this exam. All right, so speaking of passing the exam, um, there is a PBQ in the exam about motherboards. And if you don't know what PBQ is, that is short for performance-based question. In other words, a simulation. So if you guys plan on sitting for the A plus exam, there is two exams. I'm sure most of you guys know that already. You need to write both and pass both to earn the A plus certification. There's not a specific order you need to write them in. There's not a specific order you need to pass them in with. As long as you eventually pass both of them, you'll ultimately get your A plus certification. And in this exams, both of them, the majority of your questions will be theory questions. The majority of them will be monkey puzzle questions, which means you'll be presented with a question. It'll give you four possible answers, of which in most cases you can only choose one answer. Not all questions are like that, though. One of the kinds of questions you can also expect in the exam is a PBQ, performance-based question, which is also known as a simulation. So where they'll actually physically have you do something in the exam. Some of these PBQs are quite advanced. Some of them are pretty straightforward. So there's a PBQ in the exam where they show you a motherboard, a full-blown motherboard, and you are going to be tasked with dragging the correct names to the correct components on the motherboard. So that's basically it. It's like a puzzle. So they're going to go show you guys a picture of a motherboard and you're going to have to drag the correct name to the correct component on the motherboard. So you can see in this picture in front of us, it's a picture of the CMOS battery. So they might have CMOS battery or coin cell battery or something listed as an option on the left. And you're going to have to drag that name next to the coin cell battery onto the motherboard. It's actually a very easy simulation. It's almost impossible to get it wrong. But I still want to mention it to you folks so that you at least know that you should pay attention to where what is on the motherboard. You do not need to know for this exam what socket CPU someone has, what kind of RAM they have. No, you just need to know where the RAM goes. You just need to know where the CPU goes, where the PCIe card goes, in other words, your graphics card, where does the coin cell battery go, that kinds of stuff. If you can identify that on the motherboard in the exam, you'll be aces. Now, speaking of identifying things on the motherboard, so in this picture, never mind the coin cell battery, we can obviously see those graphics card slots and a couple of other slots there, which are known as expansion slots. So let's move on to expansion slots. It's a connection slot or slots on the motherboard in which adapter cards can be installed to extend the range of functions of the computer and what it can obviously go and can perform. So we've spoken about graphics cards. If you go and put in a graphics card, the chances are you might already have a built-in graphics card. But when you go and put a graphics card in, that means you're greatly enhancing the graphics capabilities of your machine. So you can probably go and play fancy games, do some fancy rendering, that kinds of stuff. And rendering is something I need, mind you. So with me making these huge A plus videos and stuff, it's not always as easy, easy as it seems. It's not just about recording and editing these videos. You need a graphics card to render these videos. And let me tell you, the bigger the video is, the bigger and the fancier graphics card needs to be to be able to, to be able to render these videos. It becomes nearly impossible to render a video as soon as it becomes more than an hour. You know, you need a gaming graphics card to be able to render these videos then. Now, other kinds of expansion cards you get will probably be things like network cards, giving you additional network capabilities, TV cards. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to go and get those anymore. It might be a sound card. It might be an internal modem. The point is these expansion cards normally expand on the capabilities of your machine, giving it additional capabilities. So if I put in an external network card, my machine can now go and connect to networks or additional networks if it already had a working built-in 
network port and all that kinds of stuff. Now you'll find that the average motherboard has multi-bus design which allows different expansion slots on the motherboard. So you've got your PCIe Express, you know the E stands for Express which is multiply 16 so that's your graphics card. You get your normal PCI slots, you get your mini PCIe slots. So I would definitely encourage you guys to go to Google or some sort of website of your choice, find a picture of a motherboard and go and check where is what on the motherboard. Just the basic stuff. So where is the PCIe slot? Where is the PCE, a PCI slot? Where's the mini PCIe slots? Where's the jumper cables go? Where does the SATA cable go plug in? Where does the CPU go? The RAM slip slots go? Just go find a motherboard online, go and check where does what go, because there is a question exam about that where you're gonna have to go and drag and drop. Now I can't guarantee that you guys are gonna get that question because at the end of the day, the amount of questions you're gonna get per exam is normally between 19 and 100 questions. And the actual pool of possible questions is normally anywhere between 300 and 1,000 even more. So they will randomly take questions out of that pool. So you might get questions, you know, that could be this motherboard, you might not get the motherboard. So maybe you're sitting at the exam with one of your colleagues or friends, he or she gets it and you don't get it. So, but at least you know about it so that if you do get that question exam, at least then you know how to go and answer it. So yeah, these there's a lot of slots on the motherboard, these expansion slots. Some of them do allow you to actually support, you know, some of the older technologies there. So yeah, it's, it's to give you additional capabilities, folks. Now just to add on to this so you guys know what I'm talking about, let me show you that bottom left of the motherboard again. So where are the slots? So you need to especially be careful of those ones. Those are the ones that the guys normally lose marks for in the exam because you get multiple PCIe slots and multiple PCI slots. So the one way at the top is your PCIe slot. That's your main graphics card slot. You'll see they've got a multiply 16 there. And then there's a PCIe multiply 8 there. That is another graphics card slot, which is a bit slower. You get your PCIe 1 there, that's that small little one. And then you get any other white slots that are okay, there in this picture, it's actually a black slot, but you also get normal expansion slots, which is PCI. The normal PCI is normally for things like your TV, network cards, sound cards, that's what those ones are for. So if you do get this question exam, my suggestion to you guys would be, Start with the things you do know because most of these answers you'll find, I think all of them actually, you can only use them once. So if you know where the CPU is, drag the CPU name to the CPU. If you know where the RAM is, drag the RAM name to the RAM. And eventually you're going to find you're only going to be left with like one or two. And if you're only left with one or two possible answers and there's only one or two blank blocks, you'll, able be, you'll be able to actually very easily identify which is which by the process of elimination. 10 to 1, one of the ones the average person will be left with is PCIe 1. And if you see the blank slot there, then you'll know, oh yeah, that's the one that was PCIe 1. So by process of elimination, you can actually get all the answers right to this question exam, folks. All right, so let's move a little bit to the bottom right again of this motherboard. So like I said, you could possibly find that coin cell battery at the bottom right as well. Not that that's a topic right now anymore, but you could possibly find it there. So at the moment we're focusing specifically on the SATA ports and the legacy PATA ports. So that is what your old IDE cables, you know, where they would go and plug in. We call those PATA cables. We're actually going to cover that in the legacy cable section. So we're currently in the second main section of this module. And in the third main section, we're going to talk about legacy cable types. One of which is your old PATA cables, also known as IDE cables. We used to use those on our old hard drives and on our old optical drives. So if you had an old DVD-ROM drive or an old CD-ROM drive, that is what you would plug it into. We would plug it in, plug those devices into those old PATA cables. It's a very wide cables. Now you, you're going to have a very hard time, if I'm being honest, finding a motherboard that still has one of those ports. Motherboards these days do not have those ports. If you find a port like that on a motherboard, it's probably because it's a very old motherboard from 10 years or more ago. You are not going to find a motherboard with a slot like that. They're extinct at this point in time on all the new motherboards. So yeah, we could go and use that for our old hard drives, or we could go and use that for our old optical drives. One end would plug into the motherboard, and the other end of the cable would have two connectors. You can connect both connectors to a hard drive each, so two hard drives, or you can go and connect both connectors to an optical drive each, in other words, two optical drives, or... You can go and connect one of those connectors to a, uh, to a hard drive and the other one to an optical drive. It was really your choice how you want to go and mix and match those. 
The average motherboard would normally have about two part out ports, which means you can go and connect two cables, which supports two devices each. So in total, you can go and connect up to four devices. If you had more than two IDE ports on the motherboard, yeah, that would probably be a fancy motherboard. Now looking at the SATA ports they've got, I see this motherboard actually has six SATA ports. On average, the average motherboard only have about two or four. I think the average number would probably be about four. That's probably the most universal number you'll find on the average motherboard. So anything more than six SATA ports, you should consider yourself very lucky since most motherboards only come out with four of those ports. So you'll notice if you look into those little ports there, you can only plug them in one way. I would actually want to actually want to go as far as to say that these cables are made idiot proof. You cannot plug them in the wrong way. They're basically made idiot proof. So yeah, you can only plug them into those ports one way. When it comes to the actual devices themselves, this is once again going to be optical drives and hard drives. This is just connected now with the new cables instead. And on the actual devices themselves, they can only plug in one way as well. Nothing to worry about in that regard. Now still on the same bottom right corner of the motherboard, now we're just going to look at the other connectors here at the bottom right of the motherboard. The first thing I want to make clear, just like the CMOS battery, this is usually at the bottom right, but it's not set in stone. So if you look at the, 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 the way the bottom right there, where it says front panel headers, that is normally always going to be at the bottom right. The question is just where at the bottom right. It might actually be at the bottom bottom, like where it is right now, or it could be slightly more up to where those SATA connectors are. If you look at those USB headers or audio headers, those are normally at the bottom right where they are right now. In some cases, you might find them at the bottom left on the motherboard. The good news is all of these are always very clearly labeled on the motherboard. Now, starting with the front panel headers. At first glance, it might actually look like two rows of, pin, of pins, each of them having five pins each. In other words, 10 pins in total. But if you look very closely, you'll find it's not 10 pins. It's not two rows with five pins each. It is two rows of pins, but one row has got five pins. The other row has actually, in fact, only got four pins. One of the pins is, in fact, missing. That is just to help keep you track where you are and all that. You'll find every two pins is normally color-coded. Not always the case, but on all the new motherboards these days, that actually is the case. Two pins will be highlighted in red. So the bottom of those two pins you'll find on the plastic base, it's going to be colored in red. Two of them will be blue. Two of them will be yellow or orange. And two of them are going to be green. Now next to the two red pins, you'll find that they've written PWR, which is short for power. And next to the two blue ones, you'll find PWR space RST, which is power reset. You'll find next to the yellow ones or orange ones, it normally says HDD space LED, in other words, hard drive LED light. And then you'll find PWR um, space LED next to the green one in most cases. That's the power light. So starting with the red one, which is probably the most important one out of the lot, that is your power button, folks. So the power button in any system unit is not going to work. So when you go and buy a motherboard and you buy a case, these two come separately. The power button and the reset button and all those ports in the front of your case, the audio jack, the mic jack, all the fancy lights and stuff, that comes with the case. It's built in to the case. Now, how does your machine know what to do when you press certain buttons in the front? How does your machine know which lights to turn on, when to turn them on, and how to turn them on? How it does that is because you are going to have to connect those lights and buttons to the motherboard, which is what we're looking at right now. So when it comes to the power button being the most important button, it's got a very small little wire with a little plastic connector that needs to plug into two pins. On that connector, you'll find it's got written PWR, in other words, power. And you need to slide that little connector over the two pins that says PWR, which is normally highlighted in red. Now, it's not in a specific order. It's not a one size fits all on all motherboards. Some motherboards, the two first pins might be red. On the next motherboard, might be the second two pins. I don't know. It varies from motherboard to motherboard, make to make, and model to model. So you're going to have to go and check the motherboard and check the connector. You might also be lucky and you'll find the connectors, the actual ones that are coming from the case, the wires are actually also color coded. They might be red, they might be green, and orange, and blue. And that really just makes it so much quicker and so much easier to actually go and connect this. 
it might sound like rocket science, but guys, I tell you honestly, the more you do this, the quicker you're going to see it actually, it is actually very easy. It's just muscle memory. So after a couple of times of doing this, you're going to do this in your sleep. You're not even going to think about it. So yeah, getting back to the connectors, you're going to go and connect the one that says PWR to the two red pins that says two PWR. Um, the blue wire, if you're lucky enough to have it blue, the connector will say PWR space RST. So reset the button in the front if you're lucky enough to have one in your case. That you're going to slide over the two blue pins on the motherboard, which will say PWR RST. Then the lights in the front of the case. Now you actually don't need to connect the lights up. The light is just to show an indication of what's going on in the machine to make the box look nice and fancy. But in reality, if you didn't hook up the lights, nothing's going to happen. It's just the, the case is going to be dead. You're not going to see any lights. That's it. So HDD space LED is the hard drive light. So you'll find some of the older boxes have one little small little light in the front. It's normally either orange or green. It's normally off. And if you're very busy or active on a hard drive, you've been installing something, uninstalling something, copying something on a hard drive, that light will start flickering. The more active you are on a hard drive, the more the light will start flickering, the more rapid it will start flickering, or it'll even stay on at some point. It's got no real purpose besides showing you that the hard drive is active, and that you can actually see in your task manager as well. So I, I find that one to be redundant. Then you've got the PWR space LED, power lights. So if you've got a gaming case, then yes, you're probably going to want to plug that one in. Otherwise, you're not going to see any of those fancy lights. If it's a normal office PC, ugh, you know what? You might as well leave it out because there's only like one little light in the box. It's probably going to be in the power button. You might not even be so lucky to have a light. So that one's kind of redundant in a normal office PC. But when it comes to these fancy gaming cases some of us got, they normally come with all kinds of cool little lights in the case and all that. That is where you plug that in, folks. So the PWR space LED needs to plug into the green pins. It's going to say case lights or PWR LED, something in that regard is what it's going to say. Now, since we've spoken about SATA cables and SATA ports, earlier, well, we didn't actually talk about SATA cables per se, but we did talk about the ports. Here is an example of a SATA hard drive, folks. So you can see here is where you would plug in the red cable. So the one on the right is where you would plug in your data cable, data, data, depending on which country you're from, you might pronounce that differently. That is where you'll plug that little doohickey in. On the left is where you're going to go and plug in the power connector. And if you look at it first glance, you'll see they actually look the same. It's just the length of them that's slightly different. But once again, you can only plug them in one way. You cannot plug in the power cable wrong. You cannot plug in the data cable wrong. It's impossible to do so. So yeah, that's what a SATA hard drive looks like. IDE hard drives look slightly different. I'll show you guys a picture of that a little bit later in the legacy cable section once we start talking about those cables. Now, speaking of cables, let me show you guys these kinds of cables. Network connector types. So the average laptop, the average desktop, the average server and what have you would have that port that says RJ45 on the left. That's your normal LAN cable connector. So if you go check your motherboard, or if, let me go and put it in simple terms, if you go check your, your laptop on the side of your laptop, well, not all laptops, but the majority of laptops will have that little port that you guys see there. That is where you would normally go and plug in your network cable. Almost all desktop PCs come out of those as well. That port is an RJ45 port. The cable on the right, that little connector that it has got on it, which is a transparent connector, that is an RJ45 connector. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of network cable you're using, you know, what kind of category it is and what kind of speed it is, it will always be an RJ45 connector. If you look at the cable on the right, at first glance, it might look like the same, but if you look very closely, you'll see that that port only has four copper pins, and the one on the left has got eight copper pins. The one on the left, we will always use all eight of those pins and we will always use all eight wires that's within that cable. If you look at the right, we do not necessarily use all four pins. Most of the cables I've dealt with only use two or three of those pins. But if you want to, you can go and use all four pins. It depends on how many phones you've got in your office, how they're connected and configured and all that kind of stuff. Now I kind of gave away the answer. So that cable is used for telephones, folks. So those good old fashioned old telephones you used to find your grandma's house, those old landlines, that is the cable you'd plug into those phones. The connector is an RJ11 connector. The port is an RJ11 port. 
These cables are also known as POTS, Plain Old Telephone Service or Plain Old Telephone System. So it basically comes down to the same thing. Um, so yeah, guys, remember what POT stands for? POT stands for Plain Old Telephone System or Service. And that is definitely going to be a question exam. They're going to ask you which of the following cables uses an RJ11 connector or an RJ11 port. They're probably going to say connector. And one of the possible answers they might present you of an exam is POTS. And then people are like, no, it's not that one because they don't even know what POTS stands for. POTS is plain old telephone service or system. You know, some people call it service, some people call it service system. Potato, potato, as long as you know what it is. It's the old cables that we used to use on the old telephones. That is probably going to be your answer, folks. Now, speaking of network cards and all of that, let me just bring you guys quickly back to expansion cards. I know we covered this, we covered this earlier. I want to specifically show you guys this expansion card and network card. Now, first of all, please ignore the ports on that in the card. I see this one has got two RJ45 ports. On average, realistically, they will normally come out only with one port. Now, yes, you do get network cards that do, in fact, come out of two RJ45 ports, but they're quite rare. It's normally only going to be one. So at first glance, this actually looks like an old internal modem because those actually used to have two ports and there used to be two RJ11 ports. One would plug into your modem and the other one would plug into, well, your PC and all that, you know, that kinds of stuff. So, yeah. What is your network card? It is known as a network interface card. That's the full official name. Network interface card. The short abbreviation to that would be NIC. So you'll find an IT and in the exams and the manuals and the slideshows and the courses everywhere. Everyone always refers to it as a NIC. So the next time you hear someone talk about the NIC, we're talking about your network card, folks. Now, every network interface card has a physical address embedded into it. That is known as your MAC. You can think of it as your social security number or your ID number, depending on which country you're from. It's a unique identifier, which we identify that card with. So if you're going to go online, you're going to go get up to some sort of shenanigans. We can actually trace you or identify you using your Mac. We also use that Mac to do filtering on networks. So if only certain people of certain devices are allowed to access certain resources, we can go and put a filter on the network where we only allow certain Mac addresses. And when you go and connect with a certain device to that network, if it's not one of those allowed MAC addresses, you're not going to be able to gain access to those resources. So it's a very cool function to go and have. Um, and I think they always tell you that you cannot change the MAC address, but which is not actually true. I mean, if you go take out the network card and you put a different one in, that's one way to change the network address or the MAC address. You cannot choose it then, but you can at least change it then. There are quite a few other ways where you can go and spoof a MAC address. The term spoof means you're going to go and forge something. And in this case, we're going to go and forge a MAC address. So there are ways to go and do that, but that's not the topic at hand here right now. So we're going to focus on this module today. Now, speaking of focusing on this module, that brings us to the end of the second section in this module. And it brings us to the third main section and the last main section of this module, which is legacy cable types. Now, first of all, I would like to point out the word legacy means something is old. I've seen a lot of people don't actually know what that means. So whenever we say legacy in IT, we're referring to old hardware, old software, old operating system, something that we no longer use, something very old. So if we talk about legacy cables, I actually mean very old kinds of cables that we used to use in IT, which we hardly use or never use anymore. If I were to say legacy software, I would be referring to some old software we used to use back in the day, which we no longer use. So yeah, whenever we say legacy guys, that's what we're talking about. Now, the first kind of legacy cable I want to bring your attention to is integrated drive electronics interface. Wow, try saying that five times fast. So that is an IDE cable, also known as PATA. So earlier we spoke about SATA, the SATA cables. Those are the ones we use on our new modern hard drives and new modern optical drives. Not that anyone's going to be using an optical drive these days. The ones you're seeing right in front of you, that used to be known as the PATA cables. Nobody actually called it a PATA cable though. We used to always just call this an IDE cable. Now, most commonly they were in that color and they normally had like a little pink or a little red connector on the side. As you guys can see, there's a little pink line on this picture there for the, for the cable. 
But they don't have to be, you know, white. Just like the Sata Gem, which I told you guys that it could be red, pink, yellow, any color of the rainbow. These Pata cables also came forth in any color of the rainbow. They were just most commonly in white. And the Sata ones are just most commonly in red. But it's not set in stone, those colors. Now, why is there a pink line on this cable? That line can also be any color of the rainbow. The point is, is to distinguish which pin is pin number one. So if you, if you were to go and plug this connector into your motherboard, the colored, the colored side of it, that little pink strip, needs to be facing outwards towards you. Pin one always faces towards you. You don't have to worry about it. You can actually only plug this thing in one way into the motherboard. It normally has one of those pins blocked on the little connector. So you could not plug it in wrong in the motherboard even if you tried. Um, it's just to help you along so that you can see which side is which a lot quicker if you need to go and struggle in the dark or whatever the case might be. Or if you're in a rush. So it doesn't really have, I mean, even if they remove that color strip, it, it wouldn't have a, a train smash um, reaction to it. It's just there to make your life a little bit easier. Now, as for where do we plug this into the motherboard? There's a picture for you guys. So you can see what it used to look like on the motherboard. Some motherboards used to have only one port. Some had two or three or four. The average number was about two of those ports in the average motherboard. One will be IDE1. The other one will be known as IDE2. As I've said earlier, you connect one end of a cable into one of those ports on the motherboard. And then the cable itself would have two connectors like you saw in the previous picture. One of those connectors you can connect to a hard drive. The other you can go and connect to your optical drive. Or both to a hard drive or both to optical drives. It was really your choice based on your unique requirements back in the day. Now as for the actual hard drives they used to plug into, there is a picture for you guys of what that used to look like. You can see that looks very different compared to the earlier SATA hard drive I showed you folks. So the bottom left of that picture is where you would go and plug in an IDE cable. At the bottom right is where you would go and plug in your power cable, the Molex connector we spoke of earlier. Do you remember those Molex connectors I spoke of? And if you're wondering what the heck are those pins between the data cable and the power cable, that, folks, is the jumpers. Now that is something you guys luckily don't have to struggle with. All the new hard drives don't have that anymore. But back in the day, depending on what make hard drive you had, what size hard drive you had, and how many hard drives you had, and whether you had optical drives or not, you might have had to go and put in jumpers there. So it's a little plastic connector you had to go and put over two of those pins, and that's basically going to allow you to go and choose which hard drive is the main one, which is the secondary, um, that kinds of stuff. Not something you guys need to worry about. Basically came down to master and slave. So if you had one hard drive, or multiple hard drives, one hard drive, your main hard drive would be seen as master. All the other hard drives would be seen as slave. If you had a hard drive and an optical drive on the same cable, the hard drive would normally be seen as master, and the optical drive would be seen as slave. So you had to go and choose, you know, put a pin in or put it on a certain connector or not put a pin in at all, depending on what kind of devices you have and what configuration you had, what kind of brand of hard drive you have. There was a lot of things, but normally on the sticker on the hard drive, it indicates, I don't know if you guys can see it there. So on the sticker, we can't read it properly, but you can actually see there's actually a picture of the pins and they show you where the connector needs to go, depending on what kind of configuration you've got in that specific machine. Now, moving on with the topic of legacy, here we've got serial cables. Now, you're going to have a very hard time finding these, but they are still out there. We still use them to a certain extent in server rooms, not a topic actually in this course. So back in the day, I would say 15, 20 years or more ago, we used to have motherboards that actually had ports for these kinds of cables. Your laptop, your desktop used to have this port. It used to be called your serial port, also known as your COM port. So this is also known as RS-232. So the RS stands for Recommended Standard Number 232 Interface. So that's one of its names. It also goes by DB9 connector. Now, the one we have in front of us is, in fact, a DB9 connector. If you were to go and count those little holes in that little connector there, you'd find there's nine of them. It's a DB9 connector. It's also known as a COM port. So, and then where did we always, where did we go and use this vote? So many, many moons ago, 20 years, 30 years ago, we used to use these cables for things like modems, dial-up modems to be precise. We used to use them for our old PS2 keyboards and mouses, all kinds of weird, very old technology. Now we definitely don't use these cables for our mouses and keyboards. We definitely don't even use dial-up modems anymore. So yeah, the cable is for the most part extinct. 
Where you might possibly see them still, though, is in a server room environment. I kid you not. There are certain devices in a server room that requires you to go and connect to them using a console cable. So the point, the, the, the side of the, the cable that plugs into the actual device in a server room looks like a LAN cable connector. It actually is an RJ45, but it's not a LAN cable. The other end of that cable looks like this, a serial cable. And the idea is you're supposed to plug it into your laptop or your desktop so you can go and manage that component in a server room. Now, how the heck do you do that on a new modern laptops and desktops? It's probably going to be a laptop and a server room, though. So we normally get a little converter that converts that serial to something like a USB. So we convert serial to USB, plug it into the laptop's USB port, and then we plug the other end of that cable into the console port, which looks like a normal LAN cable port on that device, that switch, that router, that firewall, whatever it might be and we do the configuration from the laptop remotely. And then folks, we've got this kind of cable, small computer system interface. Wow, I haven't said that in years. I can't remember the last time I said that. We normally always call this a SCSI cable. So we use this on SCSI drives, you know, SCSI hard drives in most cases. So first of all, the first thing you need to know about this is this interface is obsolete. We do not use them anymore. For the most part, they are extinct. I suppose you might still find them in some very rare situations in some companies where they just might not be able to replace that legacy system. So that's normally a very good reason for it. So maybe there's a company out there, there's probably more than one company out there, they've got a very old legacy system, which means old. It's a very old system. And this very old system might have some bespoken applications on it, which they cannot go and swap out. So it's a very, very old system. It's got a couple of applications running on it. Bespoke basically means custom applications. It's got applications on that system which were custom made for that company or that organization. These applications cannot be transferred to a new system. But the company still needs those applications since they were custom made. They probably paid a pretty penny for them back in the day. Maybe they do not have the money to go and get new ones. Maybe there is not a way to get new ones. Maybe there's nobody that, that knows how to go and make a new one. There could be a very good reason behind it. The point is they could possibly have something on the old systems, like old bespoken applications, which they are not going to go and transfer to a new system because it's just too risky. And if that's the case, then they might still be running the SCSI hard drives and the SCSI cables and all that. The problem of that, though, is if, God forbid, something happens to those, those systems one day, you're going to have a very hard time finding any spare parts if it's spare parts you're going to need. So all you can do for is just hope something doesn't happen to those systems. All right, so let's talk about adapter cables. So you get passive cables with different connectors on each end, kind of like the one I spoke of earlier where it has got a console cable connected on the one end and a serial cable connected on the other end. The serial connector part you're supposed to connect to your laptop, not that it's got a port for it, and the console cable connector part you're supposed to plug into the system in the server room. So that is a passive cable. Then you get active cables with circuitry to translate signaling between different interface types. Now this converter or adapter is sometimes a little converter, a physical converter that can fit into the palm of your hand. It can convert one signal to another like VGA to DVI, VGA to HDMI, DVI to HDMI, you know, any kind of thing like that. Or it could just be a small little cable that adapts from one converter to another. It can convert one kind of port to another kind of port. Now, speaking of ports, let's talk about video. So video is probably one of the most common kinds of converters you guys are going to get or the common kinds of adapters you're going to get. So if it's video, it could be something like HDMI to VGA, HDMI to display port, HDMI to DVI. You'll notice I'm, I'm just writing HDMI there because let's face it, almost everything works with HDMI nowadays. And HDMI is the new standard, so to speak. VGA is old analog. We don't really use that anymore. It's an old analog, although a lot of monitors still supports that. Display port is the new replacement for HDMI because it's got no royalties. And DVI was a replacement originally for VGA, but DVI is even being phased out to a certain degree now. Then you also get USB connectors, mind you. You get USB-C to USB-A. Um, and heck, it could also be USB hubs. So if it's a USB hub, you can go and plug something into a USB port and it effectively splits that USB port into more ports. It gives you four ports or eight ports. I think the most common number I've seen is four ports. 
So maybe your laptop or desktop has very limited ports. Maybe it's only two USB ports. You plug one of those adapters into one of those USB ports. So you're basically sacrificing one of your ports in your laptop or desktop. And it in turn gives you four extra ones. Pretty nifty, right? Then you also have USB to Thunderbolt and USB to Lightning. So essentially what I'm saying is you get so freaking many adapter cables and connectors. It is just insane. There is something out there for everyone and for everything. All you need to go and do is just look. Now, looking in the store itself might be very hard. So I find it personally a lot easier just to go online, run a search for what I'm what I'm looking for. And if I find that it's available, then I'll go into the store because maybe what you're searching for doesn't exist. Although these days, anything and everything does exist. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of module one of the full CompTIA A plus course. Remember, I said there's going to be 20 modules. So there's going to be 20 rather long videos, this one being the first one. Some might be quite long, some might be shorter, depending on what's actually being covered in that specific module. So yeah, guys, if you are brand new to the channel, remember to subscribe and hit that like button. Otherwise, you might next, miss the next modules. And before you guys disappear on me, just a special shout out to the sponsors of this channel. So I've got a couple of Patreon and PayPal sponsors. So there you guys can see them. Very, 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 very thank you to the Patreon sponsors, the PayPal sponsors. I appreciate it very much. And if you guys would also like to sponsor the channel, you can do that by hitting that thanks button below the video. Or you can become a Patreon or you can become a PayPal sponsor. Or you can find a couple of other sponsor links in the video description down below. I mean, heck, you can even go and buy me a coffee or a milkshake. But if I'm being perfectly honest, that coffee and milkshake, it's probably going to be a milkshake and it's probably going to go to my kids. Either way, you'll be doing me a favor when you do that. So, yeah, if you want to sponsor the channel or sponsor me in some small way by just buying me a milkshake, you can find all of that details in the video description down below. With all the timestamps, of course, all the video topics are down below as well. All the timestamps are in the video description down below as well. All of it is in the video description. So just go check out the video description and stay tuned for module two of the full A plus course. All right, guys, see you in module two.